Assalamu alaikum to all our viewers. As you will recall in the first uh, episode, we showed that Farid Bareni was completely wrong in his claim that the Shia do not have a single narration with an authentic chain, which shows that Umar or Abu Bakr ordered the attack on the house of the daughter of the Prophet, which led to a martyrdom. And in this show, uh, we will deal with his claim uh, that the 30 sources provided by a Shia scholar, which uh, after citations boils down to about nine individual reports. Of those nine, the first one that we will be dealing with in this show, one of their own books, uh, Iqtal Farid by uh, Ibn Abdi Rabbi. You don't have 30. And that's the game. That's the game these guys like to play. And we're going to see if these are 30 independent sources. We're going to see how um, reliable these sources are. And we're going to see if this stuff has any weight. All right. Bismillah. Okay, so point number one. Um, Mahdi Mudarsi is quoting from al Abd al-Farid. And hey, guess what? Author provides no reference. So this holds absolutely no weight. Author is too late. He's a 4th century historian. He doesn't provide a source. This means nothing to me. It shouldn't mean anything to you. In order to do that, I think this might be a good time to introduce the panel again. First of all, Sayyid Ali Imam, Sayyid Firdos and Sayyid Zedi. Assalamu alaikum, guys, and thank you for coming on board. Uh, firstly, can I pass it over to you, um, yourself, Sayyid Ali Imam? And um, the, 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 as I said, we're dealing with the uh, book Iqdal Farid. So um, what, what I'd like to discuss today is how reliable is Iqdal Farid? And are any of the allegations that Farid has raised, do they have any substance behind them or not? Is Now we've actually entered into the, the discussion in reference to what has Sunni Hadith literature said about this uh, attack that was made on the Prophet's progeny, may peace and blessings be uh, upon them. Essentially, uh, in particular, say the Fatima Salaam Alayya, who passed away um, as a result of that attack. Now, from the doubts that put forth by individuals like Freed is to deny the historical events documented in Sunni Hadith books. Uh, we've already established in our previous show that this has been mass transmitted in Shia Hadith from the progeny of the Prophet, may peace and blessings be upon them, and from their companions. Both Sunnis and non-Sunni scholars confirm that the companions of the Imam salam, had this belief. And our scholars, of course, have authenticated these reports about the attack on Sayyidah Fatima Islam Aleha, which has resulted in a martyrdom. Now, it's unfortunate that within Sunniism, they have to resort to censoring and hiding the narrations about the vices of the Sahaba and referring to some of the major crimes as ijtihad, meaning that these individuals, certain group of companions who carried out atrocious acts, were essentially acting on their own interpretation of Quran and the prophetic teachings, they will receive a reward for their efforts. So uh, in order for me to show this type of uh, censorship, I would like to uh, present a scan for the viewers uh, so they can inshallah read this for themselves. The first scholar I'd like to present is a, a contemporary Salafi scholar who goes by the name of Ibn Uthameen. And he says in his book in Shara Lohmatul Itqad, page number 151, he says, and not to mention their vices, meaning the companions' disputes, that if any were done by any one of them, then it's very tiny in comparison to the characteristics of virtues and advantages that they and maybe these vices were caused by a forgiven ijtihad. So you can see now, and by the way, this, this is something which they cannot even prove collectively for all the companions. When they talk about the virtues and the characteristics of the companions, they only mean a selective group. They only mean a selective group. But here we, we're primarily focusing on those individuals who are responsible in attacking the house of Sayyidah Fatima Salaam Aleha. Bear this in mind, it's very important. So he says that they were caused by a forgiven ijtihad and justified deeds because of this, the prophetic saying, do not insult my companions, which ironically was said about another companion. It was said about uh, Khalid bin Walid, uh, who was insulting Abd, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. When it comes to the actions of Sahaba, they try to justify their deeds, uh, their wrongdoings essentially by saying that, look, that they've been forgiven and 
you know, they give this excuse about Ijtihad, meaning that that particular companion, he was, uh, his actions were based on his interpretation of the Quran and Sunnah. The next scholar, Ibn Fawzan, is another sort of contemporary uh, Salafi scholar. And he says, and it's not allowed to talk badly about any one of them, any one of the companions. And it's not permissible to seek their mistakes if some of if, if some of them had any, if some of them had any. So they, so, so this is ironic, what, what, don't the companions have mistakes? Then we do not find them and show them to the people. So look, he, hey, he's talking about censorship. He goes, look, if there's any matters when it comes to the, the certain acts of companions, what they've done, then we do not find them and, and we, we do not show them to the people. So they conceal these matters from the public. And this is for this very reason that people like Fareed. It doesn't surprise me that, you know, he's trying to deny these events. He's only following what his scholars have essentially said and what their books of creed have taught them when it comes to the Sahaba. They don't want to discuss these things. They don't want to bring it to the public attention. Then he says, this is not allowed because of the many virtues they have that will exceed and hide what some of them may do as a mistake and atone their mistakes. And we are recommended to love them and mentioning their good qualities and ask mercy for them and ask forgiveness for them and stop mentioning any of their bad qualities and the conflicts between them. Shara al Itqad, page number 249, 252. This is from Ibn Fawzan. Al Zahabi in Sierra Al Alam, uh, Nubla, volume 10, page number 92. If it was proven, that the speech of the fellows, meaning the companions, was based on hate and partisanship, then it would not be acceptable. But it would be folded and not narrated. And it's argued that we must refrain from mentioning a lot of the quarrels between the companions and the fights. May Allah be pleased with them all. And we still find similar writings in the collections and the books and episodes. However, most of those narrations have broken chains or weak ones, and some of them are lies. And this is about what we have in our hands and the hands of our scholars. Therefore, it must be folded and hidden. It must be eradicated. It must be eradicated. Even so that the hearts will be clean and gathered over the love of the companions and being pleased with them. And hiding these writings is mainly from the groups of some scholars. However, it may be permitted for fair scholar, the one free from self biasness to, uh, to read such writings in private with a condition that he has to ask forgiveness for them as Allah is the highest has taught us. Due to the censorship involved within the books of history and hadith, as the saying goes, history is written by the victors, you will not find these events as explicitly narrated compared to what's been mentioned in Shia hadith literature, especially when it involves the companions. After all, why would any Sunni want to narrate the totality of these events, meaning the attack that was uh, uh, done on the house of Sayyidah Fatima, may peace and blessings be upon her, especially after what you've read about the approach when it comes to the Sahaba. I mean, what would essentially be the implications? Not only for themselves, but those individuals they revere and, and hold in high regard. So the Sunni approach would be to either outright reject these reports, as Freed uh, has been doing, or offer an explanation that does not go against their worldview about all the companions. Now, given that the author of Al-Aqtal Farid ibn Abdul Rabih was counted amongst the notable Sunni scholars in various fields, individuals like Farid are not able to question his credibility. So they prefer to focus their efforts in casting doubts about what they reported. In this case, by suggesting he was merely a fourth century scholar and he doesn't mention where he took it from. Therefore, in order to tackle this issue, we need to look at the status of the scholar, his book, and what if he is and what he documented contradicts other historical evidence, which is what we will see not only in this show but in later episodes. Thank you, Sayyid. An extremely interesting point you raise about Sunni scholars. Um, if they're engaging in this act of self-censorship where they cannot discuss conflict between Sahaba and it is their uh principle that one of their uh actions to actively hide or um, 
get rid of any reports of any conflicts been so ha- between Sahaba. How are their books reliable on this aspect of history? Um, absolutely, because if this is their stated um, position that they have an obligation under their creed, actively hide or remove any conflict between Sahaba uh, because their merits surpass this, then how can their opinion or their writings on historical conflicts between Sahaba be authoritative in any way, shape or form? To answer that, Sayyid Firdos, if you can shed some light on this and if you can at least help us to understand how anything they write about conflicts between Sahaba can be relied on in this situation. Uh, 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 thank you very much, Sayyid, uh, for those statements from their scholars. I think it's very important to emphasize on this uh, a bit more, as you asked also, Sayyid Azam Shah. As it is obvious for, for everyone who knows a bit or two about Sunni Hadith science, it's a strictly dogma-driven science. So the dogma being adalat to Sahaba, that is why it is from their very basic principles to refuse even discussing and reporting about conflicts and, and clashes between Sahaba and their mathalib, their dismerits, um, basically anything negative about the, them. And whoever of the scholars and narrators who did not uh, stick to this principle, they were attacked and they were weakened. So how can you provide an accurate account of their lives, the lives of companions, their deeds, their personalities, if you are only allowed to report the merits of the companions, good things about them, their fadail, while you are not allowed to report their dismerits, their, their mathalib, and whatever of, of the wrongdoings they did and also how they treated each other and and what conflicts and clashes happened between them. You get, of course, an inaccurate history, which is overshadowed by your dogma and not the other way around. So you're not basing your aqidah on on facts, but you make a dogma and, and then dismiss everything else. This is a clear logical fallacy, rather a circular logic, because you're asking for authentic history on one, on, on one hand, uh, but consider narrations or what, who, of whoever reported bad and negative things about Sahaba to be weak. So um, you've already weakened them and their narrations um, have been graded by your scholars of fabrications and, and lies. So you're looking for a history that actually tells you only good things about Sahaba and you are not actually interested in accurate and authentic history. Rather, you're after that kind of history, which does not go against what uh, you have already decided to be true, which is again, preconditioned and biased and not objective at all. So you are not actually in a position to object to incidents such as the attack on the house of the daughter of the messenger of Allah, especially when you use this kind of dishonest tools. Anyways, let's see what their scholars say about history and how to deal with historical reports. Here we have Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, he quotes um, in his book uh, Al-Ithtighatha and uh, he quotes uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, who says that in three fields and three um, sciences has no roots. Um, and that is the Maghazi, the Malahim and, and the Tafsir. Basically, and in another wording, he says that he says, Laysa laha asanit, it doesn't have chains. So, the Maghazi that basically means history of wars and stuff uh, at the time of the Prophet and after the Prophet, and the Malahim, the conflicts, the clashes that happened, and also the Tafsir, the Tafsir of Quran, the commentary of Quran has no chains. And Ibn Taymiyyah then, then uh, explains this, comments on this statement, and says, and he says that the meaning of this statement is that the, the majority of these reports and these three fields are uh, morsal and, and disconnected. The majority of these reports. Uh, so he says, فَإِذَا كَانَ الشَّيْءِ مَشْهُورًا إِنَّ أَهْلِ الْفَنِ قَدْ تَعَدَّدَ تُرْقُهُ فَهَذَا مِمَّا يَرْجُعُ إِلَيْهِ أَهْلِ الْإِلْمِ بِخِلَافِ غَيْرِهِ He says that what, so whatever in these three fields, whatever is famous, um, yeah, among the scholars of this field and has numerous chains. This is something that the scholars 
base trust, they trust this method. So even if they are disconnected reports, do not have authentic or complete chains, they, are, if they come through multiple chains of narrators, then the scholars accept it. So this is the method that, based on this method, we, we want to also prove the incidents that happened. Um, not just that, but we will provide, inshallah, authentic, completely, according to the science of Hadith, authentic reports. Uh, so this is their scholars, they, what they have said about uh, history and how to deal with historical reports. Also taking into consideration what we have said at the beginning that they have the self-censorship of a method also, that they have already dismissed mo most of these narrations. And even with that, we have still bits and pieces that we can put uh, to make a clear picture of what happened back then. We have another contemporary scholar, um, a professor, uh, in a very famous professor actually in, he, he was a professor in, in uh, universities in Saudi Arabia and currently I think he, he's in Qatar or somewhere. He has a book um, which is called Asirat al Nabawiyat al Sahiha. And um, he says um, at the beginning of this book that um, basically there's no doubt that's subjecting every historical report we wish to accept um, to the same conditions required for validating hadith as a type of abuse. So it's a type of ta'asof, he says, because the reports on which these conditions are applied are not enough to cover the different eras of Islamic history. So he's basically saying, if we apply these, these rules of hadith on history, then we will, we will get a history with, which has blank parts we don't have anything to, to fill them with um, because we don't have connected chains for this for those. And he says that, which produces gaps in our history. If we were to compare that approach with the histories of the world, uh, then much of it is based on single reports or unknown historians. In addition to that, they are all um, uh, full of gaps. So he says, if we do this method, then we will it will be like the, the rest of the world, the history books of the rest of the, the world. So we will have a history which, which has been reported by unknown uh, historians. We don't know anything about them. And most of the, the history will, be, ha will have gaps uh, in them. So we will not have a clear picture of what, what, what was going on. And he continues says, Hence, for this reason, in subsequent eras, it is enough to attain trust in the Adala of the historian. So he says, for this reason, if we have these historical uh, history books, history reports, we need to look at the historian who has reported this. If the historian himself is, is credible, then what is what he reports is also credible. And um, he says, Hence, for this reason, in subsequent eras, it is enough to attain trust in the Adala of the historian and, their, and their, in their precision and recording history in order to accept what they have uh, recorded, alongside utilizing the principles of Hadith criticism in history, even there is contradiction between two uh, between um, um, historians. So he's basically saying that um, we should look at just at the at the um, credibility of the historian himself, and um, uh, whenever we have contradictory reports about the, uh, an event, then we need to have we need to use some kind of other rules like uh, rules of hadith, uh, um, authenticating hadith, and so on, to perform one report. Uh, of the one historian over the other one. So in matters of contradictions, we need to apply further rules to, to clarify which one is more accurate. So, um, but as we go to also the, to the book itself, Al-Iqd al-Farid by Ibn Abdul Rabbi, he says at the beginning or at the intro of this book, um, basically he justifies why he removed or gives the reasons why he removed the chains of narrators. From, from this book, he says, or of most of it. Um, he says, um, and I removed the chains of most of the reports to make the book short and compact and to avoid making it heavy and lengthy uh, because there are either uh, 
Mahikam uh, and Awadar, he says, this is basically because these are beneficial reports, reports about uh, literature, wisdom, stuff like this, rare, rare stuff. And um, that's if I uh, narrate it through chains, it doesn't, uh, without chains, it doesn't uh, harm the, the purpose. And um, basically, it gives a few examples of these that in the past, past scholars did also the same thing. They did not provide for everything a chain of narratives. It says, this, I have chains of narratives, but I removed them because I wanted to make the book a bit shorter and not too heavy to, to carry. So um, he also gives, among the reasons that he gives, he, he quotes one of, he says that, uh, and, and it has been narrated from Al Esme, another historian, um, to third uh, century historian, Al Esme. Once he narrated a report, a narration, and someone asked him about its chain. And he says basically, so he's, it's, he says that it, this is from the decisive verses, meaning that's a established fact. It doesn't. Um, uh, he says, this is something established and does not need actually a, a, an evidence proof, a chain to prove it because it's already famous. It's, it's something and, uh, something widespread. So basically he says that sometimes when I, when I mention something, if I don't mention the chains of that, it, it also means that this is something meshur. This is something uh, widespread, uh, widespread among scholars. So you have heard what Ibn Taymiyyah says, that you need to look at the um, historians that have narrated it and, and if we have multiple chains for something. And here we have Ibn Abdul Rabi saying the same thing, that he basically uh, um, narrates some 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 reports uh, without chains because um, they are widespread they are mashhur they are widespread among scholars and we have also dr ziyal umari who said that um, we need to look at the historian himself if if the historian himself is is credible then we can also accept his uh, statement um Said Fultos, if i uh, may come in for a second uh, so from what i understand Ibn Tahmiyyah and Ahmad Ibn Hanbal have uh, also talked about where there are no proper chains or they're disconnected chains. And Dr. Uh, Diyal Amri, I think you were mentioning, um, who said that subjecting historical reports to the conditions of hadith is an abuse. And he used the word abuse, which is quite telling. And that if reports are from credible historians, they should be accepted, unless there's a contradiction in which further rules apply. You're also mentioning that in the book Iqtal Farid, uh, the chains have been removed for two reasons. Firstly, because um, he didn't want to make the book bulky. And secondly, because um, the reports were much they were well known. I'm, I'm not sure if people understand the implication, uh, Sayyid Firdos, of having very bulky books and why there would be a need to reduce the size of them. Um, and um, what, what other implications would apply, such as the cost of writing books, the time needed. I, I, that may need a bit more clarification, Sayyid, for those, if I may. Thank you, Sayyid Nazim Shah. So um, uh, about the question about the length of the book, because this was this is common among, uh, if you have many, many books, uh, Sunni and Shi books that, um, because of the content, they've removed that uh, chain of narrative. Sometimes, for, for example, this book is basically, more of a, a, a literature book than a, a book of history. He has a one, one particular chapter or um, one juz, which is talking about the history and uh, the history about the prophet, a brief uh, kind of history about the prophet and, and the caliphate after, after the prophet. So for the rest, which is just basically poetry, wisdom stuff, uh, reports about this, which are beneficial in, in in um, in literature, so to speak, they have literature value, um, and he says for those it's it's it doesn't matter if you have chains because the value is in the content, not in the chains. Um, uh, as about the part which is talking about the history, uh, we can refer to his comment uh, to his introduction that sometimes he 
to remove chains because they are widespread. This this is famous, so it's uh, it does not need any proof. And he quotes uh, Al Ismai as an example for this kind. The reports that we are talking about Saqifa and what happened and and uh, and who uh, did not participate in the pledging allegiance to Abu Bakr and the, uh, they come to threat with burning the house of the of the daughter of the messenger of Allah. So this this um, chapter that he starts with falls into that category of history that he talks about in this book. As about the status of the, the scholar himself, Ibn Abdul Rabbih, um, uh, here we have, for example, the Habi, he says, um, al adib al akhbari he says, a very, the very knowledgeable scholar, the uh, literary um, uh, writer um, who writ written books about uh, literature, um, akhbari which means histor uh, historian, and uh, he is the author of Kitab al-Iqd. And um, he says who has narrated from him and who he narrated from and so on. And then he says, uh, uh, he was a trustworthy, noble, eloquent in speech and a poet. And he says um, he lived like 82 years and passed away at the, uh, in the year um, 328. He was of the virtuous possessors of uh, abundant information, abundant knowledge, and the scholars who had reports from the first and later generations. Avalin al Mutaakhirin, he says. And his book, Halicht, um, indicates his great virtues and his abundant and important knowledge. However, many of his speeches indicate that he had a tashayo and a tendency to lower down Bani Umayya. And this is weird of him because he was one of their supporters, one of the Mawali of Bani Umayya. And it was more fitting for him to be of their friends and not <laughs> of their enemies. <laughs> Basically, because of that, he reports, Alaqt al-Farid, we have many reports about the Khulafa of Bani Umayya who exposes their nature. So things that, um, that do not that do not fit the image of the Salafi scholars like Ibn Kathir, and he says that's why he he says he was more inclined towards Tashayo, just because because he reported some some negative stuff about Bani Umayyah, even though he himself belonged to Bani Umayyah actually, um, and um, he says this is weird, and um, he does not like it that that he he uh, reported those stuff about Bani Umayyah, so. Uh, this also shows the, the kind of bias that they have, as, as we have uh, spoken about at the beginning. Also, there we have other scholars like um, Abu Fada. He says in Al Muhtasar fi Akbal al Bashar, he says that he was one of the scholars who possessed a bond of uh, abundant archives uh, um, of history, of course, and, and literature and and. Um, Arabic, Arabic literature and stuff like this. Abu al-Abbas al-Mukri, and um, he says that he preserved it, uh, this book, he praises the book itself, that he preserved it from, from any slips that could be attributed to it. So he, he made this book very fine, very powerful in its content. Um, so we here we have uh, Ibn Abdul Rabbi and the, the actual passage that uh, that we are discussing about. Um, let us quote because he, he makes a complete chapter about this and says, "Alladina taqallafu an bayat Abu Bakr," and uh, that means that those who refused to give bayat to Abu Bakr, those who did not participate in pledging allegiance to Abu Bakr, and it says they were Ali, Wal Abbas, Wal Zubayr, Wal Saad ibn Ubada. فأما علي والعباس والزبير فقعدوا في بيت فاطمة تبعث عليه إليهم أبو بكر عمر بن الخطاب ليخ ليخرجوا من من بيت فاطمة. He says that um, they those who refused to or, or step aside and did not pledge allegiance to Abu Bakr they were علي والعباس والزبير and سعد بن بادة and as about علي والعباس and and الزبير they um, gathered in the house of uh, Fatima until Abu Bakr sent uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab to bring him out from, their, from, the, from the house of Fatima. And Abu Bakr said to, uh, to Umar, in Abu Faqatilhum, if they refuse to come and pledge allegiance, then fight them. 
So that's uh, that will be discussed in another report later, inshallah, that um, actually Abu Bakr then at the end of his life, at his death, death, uh, he um, regrets this and says, even if the house uh, was closed for war, I should have not attacked the house of Fatima. So here we have the same thing. So another another indication, another correlation between two, two reports. We will discuss that one, of course, later. But he says that Abu Bakr actually said to Mar commanded him, if they refuse to come to Paybayab, then, then fight them. And Faqbala bi qabasim nar. He and Umar came with a with um, with a stick of fire, brought fire with him to the to the house of Fatima to to burn the house if they refused to come. And um, he says, فَلَقِيَتُ فَاطِمَةَ فَاطِمَةَ فَقَالَتْ يَبْنَ الْخَطَابِ أَجِئَتَ لِتُهْرِقَ دَارَنَا And uh, Fatima sallallahu alayhi wa sallam confronted, confronted him, him uh, Umar, and said, O oh, son of Khattab, are, did you come to, to uh, are you attending to, to burn the house, our house? And Umar replied, yes. أَوْ تَدْخُلُ فِي مَا دَخَلَتْ فِي الْأُمَّةِ um, you either come with me to pledge allegiance, like the rest of the Ummah, or I will I will burn it, burn down the the house. So this is the actual uh, the actual passage that Ibn Abdul Rabbi says, and we can we can see that he makes an entire chapter, even though he does not mention it chains. It's um, as we saw the introduction of this book, he puts us like this because it's of the Things that is mashhur. This is something that is widespread. That's why he may he tries to make it clear of of the groups, the opposition that there was for the for pledging allegiance to Abu Bakr. As we have seen, uh, the status of Ibn Abdul Rabbi is that he's a is a known historian, very knowledgeable, as um, mentioned by al Dhahabi, Ibn Kathir, Abu Fida, and other scholars who praised them and praised the book and then said the, the book is, is a masterpiece, it's a very useful book. And um, they, they, they didn't have anything bad to, to say about him, except that Ibn Kathir does not like that he reported some stuff about against Bani Umayyah, which, yeah, which is basically understandable from, from his stance. Um, but um, yeah, uh, other than that, there is nothing negative about the, the, the author. The author is credible and also the passage that he says about this incident uh, or or those who did not pledge allegiance and what were the circumstances that was also clear and uh, i think it needs we will uh, throughout this series inshallah we will look at the details and and um, see the correlations of each passage that, that he talks about from other re reports, from other books with chains and stuff like that. So thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, with this, I pass on to Sayyid uh, Nazim Shah. Thank you, Sayyid, for those. Um, so if I can quickly just go over a few things. Ibn Abdi Rabbi, um, the author of Iqtal Farid. So people like al Dhahabi, Ibn Kathir and Abu Al-Fida have validated him as a bona fide uh, scholar uh, and somebody who is trustworthy and who cannot be easily condemned or refuted by anyone once uh, these uh, um, quite prominent Sunni scholars have validated him. Um, thank you. And you also mentioned the narration in Iqdal Farid mentioning the disagreement between Hazrat uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib and Abu Bakr. And I can understand why Farid would want to lower or, or reject the, the, the reports in this book because he's actively working towards his dogmatic ideology, hiding differences between Sahaba, which is a part of their faith. Um, now, um, Sayyid Zaidi, um, can I um, ask you to shed more light uh, on the disagreements between the Sahaba and especially um, if there were any other people who uh, rejected the Khilafah of uh, uh, Abu Bakr uh, when he proclaimed that he was now going to lead the Muslim Ummah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi ala ahlihi wa salatu wa salamu ala ahliha. Thank you so much. That's a really good question that you brought up. 
And to answer this question, yes, there were a lot of people that were in disagreement with Abu Bakr, Omar, and the whole team. There were a group of Ansar that were gathering at Saqifa Banu Sa'ada. It was a place on the outskirts of Medina that people would gather and would actually have a discussion about stuff. So Ansar, or the people of the Medina, both from the two tribes. So there were two tribes of Ansar. One was Awas, the other one was Khazraj. You would understand this context that Umar ibn al-Khattab, as the reports say, I'm not really sure if that's true or not, but the Sunni version of um, the report says that uh, Umar actually, when he heard that Prophet passed away, he just got a little bit crazy uh, in a way that he was saying that anyone who says that Prophet uh, is, is dead, I will chop off his head and I'll kill him. And he was saying that actually the way Prophet Musa alayhi salatu was salam went from his um, people to the mountain for 40 days. Likewise, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would go for 40 days. And when he will come back, he will make the munafiqeen or the hypocrites accountable. So this was the whole context that was going through. Imagine a person who has been so deeply affected. Suddenly, a person comes in, a second person comes in, he whispers something, and that person becomes completely fine. So this is what happened. So Umar was in this state. Abu Bakr and Abu Ubaida al-Jarrah, they came in. And then something was being whispered to Umar. And all three of them, you know, uh, here I'm just paraphrasing the history, right? There might be few words, so there might be some incidents that might be a bit up and down, but the gist of it, it's really authentic. So these three people went to Saqifa Bani Sa'ida, and then they went, and then they basically had a discussion with the Ansar. And the way it went through was that, you know, it's, it's amazing. And if you go through the books of their Aqidah, you would understand this, that they would say that even if one person gave pledge of allegiance, their bay'ah, to another person who is qualified, quote unquote, then that person becomes the imam of whole Muslim ummah, of whole Muslim nation. And everyone has this religious duty to follow that imam. What is your dalil? Oh, people, you say this. Oh, scholars, you are saying this. What is your dalil? What is your proof when you say this? So they say their proof is that what happened on the day of Saqifa when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died. And basically, this hadith you can see in Sahih al-Bukhari, page number, it's printed from Dari bin Kathir. And this is really long report. And it starts from page 1689. and goes all the way to 691. And the hadith is 6830. So basically, it tells um, someone was saying that when Umar will go, this will happen and that will happen. So Umar is quoting the incident of Saqifa, the way he remembers and the way he wants people to know. So what he says was that at that time when he, they went to ben, Saqifa Banu Sa'ada, Ali and Zubair, remember these two names, and the people that were with them. So they were not even Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam and Zubair ibn Awam. There were other people with them that opposed us. So we can clearly say there were oppositions from the beginning, from the start. There were groups that were not, um, that were not happy with the Khilafah of Abi Bakr. So then it says that there was a hue and cry. There was a lot of, um, you know, like back and push. And people were gathered at Saqifah ibn Sa'ida. And there Omar said, Oh Abu Bakr, hold your hand out. He held his hand out and I pledge. Who is saying this? Omar ibn Khattab. I pledge allegiance to him. And then all the immigrants, all the Ansar, they gave their pledge of allegiance. And so did the Ansar afterwards. So, sorry, immigrants means Muhajirun. And then afterwards, Ansar gave their bay'ah too. So here you see that the first person who gave the bay'ah to Abu Bakr was whom? Umar ibn al-Khattab. And this is the reason if you go through their books of theology, they say that even if one person gives the bay'ah to another person, that person becomes the imam of whole Muslim nation, right? And the proof they use is the proof of Umar ibn al-Khattab giving pledge of allegiance to Abu Bakr. So the tradition continues further. And it says that Sa'ad bin Urbada, you know, Sa'ad bin Urbada, who was the chief 
who was the head of the Khazra tribe of Ansar, right? He became, obviously, he became really angry, right? And the hadith continues that uh, one of the Ansar said that you killed Sa'ad bin Ubadah. You know, there was so push towards the Abu Bakr that the people didn't realize that Sa'ad bin Ubadah, who was the chief of the Khazraj, uh, Banu Khazraj, uh, he might be killed because people might push him down. Then I replied, who replied? Umar ibn al-Khattab, that Allah has killed Sa'ad bin Ubadah. Now, I ask my viewers and people that are listening to it, just go through this uh, tradition and the report again. You can go to the English translation too, and you can go through the report again. Do you really think that the companions were so peaceful and they, were, they really liked each other the way people portray them or the way the Sunnis portray them, actually? See, what has been said? Qatawallahu sa'adan. Allah has killed Sa'ad bin Ubadah. It's basically wishing that may Allah kill Sa'ad bin Ubadah for the things he has done. Then Umar said, by Allah, apart from then he continues whatever happened and the way the Pledge of Allegiance was given. And what he said was that he actually, if you go through page number 106, uh, 1690, it says, Inna ma kanat Abi Watamat. You know, the, the, the pledge of allegiance that was given to Abu Bakr was filter. Filter is called what? A sudden act. Something which which is done because people are in hurry to do something. And it has negative consequences because it is done so quickly. So it is not something that Umar is praising the mode or the methodology that was deployed at that time. Even Omar is mentioning that, but he says, because Abu Bakr was an exception, so we would take that as an exception, but no one should make a general rule out of it. So you can clearly see there were, there were three groups, I would say. One were the Ansar, and within Ansar, there were two groups. One who wanted uh, Sa'ad bin Ubadah to be the leader, the other one that w didn't want Sa'ad bin Ubadah to be the leader. Then there were the groups of Quraysh or the Muhajirun, uh, they were led by Abu Bakr, Umar, and uh, Khalid ibn Walid and Abu Ubaid al-Jarrah. They wanted the caliphate to be given to Abu Bakr. And the tribe and the, the sub-tribe within Ansar that were opposing Sa'ad bin Ubada, they hooked up and they sided with Abu Bakr. And then there was another uh, opposition, which was from Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salatu wassalam. And of course, Banu Hashim were with Amir al-Mu'mineen at, at that time. And also Zubair ibn Awam, he also supported Amir al-Mu'mineen at that time. And there will be more details that will be followed, inshallah. So Ibn Hajar al-Sqalani in his book, Fath al-Bari, volume 15, page 654. And the book is published by Dar Tayyibah. And he says, وَخَالَفَ عَنَّا عَلِيًّا وَزُبَيْرِ وَمَنْ مَعَهُمَا So he quotes the wordings of Bukhari. He says, فِي رَوَايَةِ مَالِكْ وَمَعْمَرْ وَأَنَّ عَلِيًّا وَزُبَيْرُ وَمَنْ كَانَ مَعَهُمَا تَخَلَّفُوا فِي بَيْتِ فَاطِمَةَ بِنْتِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَكَذَا فِي رَوَايَةِ سُفْيَانِ لَكِنْ قَالَ الْعَبَّاسِ بَدْلَ زُبَيْرُ So what it mentions is that Ali and Zubair, the wordings of Bukhari, and whom those whom were with them refrained from us, didn't give the bay'ah. In the narration of Malik and Ma'mar, Ali and Zubair and those who were with them gathered at the house of Fatima al-Zahra, salawatullah alayha, the daughter of the messenger of Allah. So you can clearly see what was the pinnacle thing. What were, where were the people that were opposing the caliph of that time? Where were they gathering? They were actually gathering in the house of Fatima al-Zahra, salawatullah alayha. And that included Amir al-Mumneen and Zubair and the people that were with him. Then we have Ibn Hisham, uh, Sayyidah of Ibn Hisham, page, page number 662, published by Darul Kutub al ilmiya and it's translated by Muhammad Mehdi al-Sharif. Uh, it tells the story about uh, Banu Sa'ada, Saqifah Banu Sa'ada. It says that, uh, it mentions Ibn Ishaq that says that when the Messenger of Allah died, the Ansar assembled around Sa'ad bin Urbada in the shed of Banu Sa'ada. Ali bin Abi Talib, Zubair bin Awam, and Talha 
Ibn Ubaidullah. You know, when we talk, look, one point that I want to mention for my dear viewers is that when we mention these big personalities, it doesn't just mean that these were the three people that were against Abu Bakr, or when we mention Abbas, Amir al-Mu'min, Zubayr, Talha, Fatma al-Zahra, Sallallahu Alaihi and other people. It just doesn't mean that these were the only people that were against him. See, these were the people that were symbolic figures. This symbolic figure means that if Zubair is not following one action or he is not taking one course of action, then everyone who follows Zubair or everyone that looks to Zubair for the religious guidance wouldn't follow the same thing, right? When we say that there were three heads, the, the Talha, Zubair, and Aisha, they went against Amir al-Mu'mneen alayhi salatu wasalam and they fought a war in Basra that's commonly known as Battle of Jamal. It's, it just doesn't mean that these were the three people that were fighting against Amir al-Mu'mneen. It meant that everyone that they had control over, that they had the religious authority over, all of them looked over to them and they followed what these three people did. And that's why you see there were a lot of people that came in Basically, the people of Basra or the army of Aisha was in large number as compared to the people of Kufa or the army of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Likewise here, when we say that these symbolic figures, Ali, Talha, Zubair, and these people didn't give pledge of allegiance, right? It just doesn't mean that we are mentioning only these three people. It also means that all those people, the Banu Hashemite and everyone that followed Amir al-Mu'mineen and likewise followed Zubair and Talha, they never wanted to give bay'ah to Abu Bakr. Now we go to the next reference, and this is from Ibn Hibban, and he has a book called Mashahiru Ulama Il Amsar. And this book is published by Darul Kutub Al Ilmiya, Beirut, and it's, uh, the page number is 10. And he mentions about Abu Bakr bin Abi Quhafa as Siddiq, radiyallahu anhu, right? That's what Ibn Hibban mentions. That's the way he wants to mention his first caliph. So what he mentioned is that when the Pledge of Allegiance was given to uh, Abu Bakr, so Amir al-Mu'mineen and a group of Banu Hashim would then step away from giving the bay'ah until Fatima, salamullah alayha, or radiallahu anha, passed away after six months post death of the Messenger of Allah. So after Message of Allah, the Sunni belief is that she uh, was uh, she was alive for six months, and after this, she was that then Ali pledged him um, who then Ali Amir al Mumnina Ali his salatu was salam gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr and also those people that we have mentioned in the book of Khulafa. So now you can clearly see that for six months Amir al Mumnina Ali his salatu was salam and all the Hashmiites, all the Banu Hashim and Banu Hashim, mind you, they were just not, not normal clan or normal uh, group of people. This is the same clan or this is the same family from which Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emerged. And it, it was such an important clan that even at the time of Jahiliyyah, Abdul Muttalib Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, he had a contract with whom? With Banu Khuza'a. Remember this name, right? Banu Khuza'a. And Banu Khuza'a were such an important ally to Banu Hashim that even when Sulh al-Hudaybiyah took place, right, when the peace treaty took place between Muslims and non-Muslims or the, the Quraysh of those time, right, Banu Khuza'a, instead of siding with Quraysh, they sided with Muslims at that time. And these were the same Banu Khuza'a that were being brutally killed by Quraysh, by Banu Bakr, and that led to the conquest of Makkah. So just, it just tells you the importance of Banu Hashim. When we say Banu Hashim, it's just not like a normal family that you would see like one family. It means everyone that included among uh, the Hashmiites and also the people that will look to Banu Hashim for their guidance. So when we say Banu Hashim were not siding with Abu Bakr, that technically means that Banu Khuza'a, that were the closest alive of Banu Hashim, and eventually they were closest to life for the Muslims, they probably didn't even follow the suit. They even didn't give the Pledge of Allegiance to Abu Bakr, right? So here, when they say Banu Hashim, it just, it's a symbolic thing. Again, I'm saying history has a lot of symbolism. 
And one of the symbolism is that when they mention the tribes, it just doesn't mean that those were the only tribes that were against one thing. It also means that the allies that were um, were with those with that specific clan had the same opinion too. Now we go to the next reference, and this reference is from Al Kamil fi Tariq, and this uh, is a book by Ibn Athir. And Ibn Athir mentions about Hadith of Saqifa wa Khilafatu Abi Bakrin radiallahu anhu wa ardahu. Uh, this book is published by Darul Kitab al Arabi, Beirut, Lebanon, and it's volume number two, page number 187. And he mentions that the Ansar, or some people from among the Ansar, they said, What did they say? This is important for people to understand. Now, one of the opinions that we have is that um, the Ansar, uh, not all of them, you know, wanted to give the bay'ah to Abu Bakr. A lot of them that were doing whatever they did was to make sure that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, who was busy at that time, looking after the burial of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, looking after the janaza, after the dhutfin, after everything that was important to do with the body of, uh, the, with the blessed body of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ansar, one of the theory was that Ansar wanted to buy the time, right? Some of the Ansar that also possibly might have included Sa'ad bin Ubadah too. They wanted to buy the time. The way they wanted to buy the time was that something might come up so that these Qurayshis or the Muhajirun, the quote unquote, these Muhajirun, they don't go over and then they make Caliph from their own people because explicitly the Khilafah was given to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam on the day of Badir. And no one had the right to take the Khilafah, but Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam after the demise of Holy Prophet. So even as he says that, فَقَالَتْ uh, الْأَنصَارِ With an Ansar, or all Ansar, or بعض Ansar, or within, like people among the Ansar, لَا نُبَايِعُوا إِلَّا عَلِيًّا That we wouldn't give Pledge of Allegiance, we wouldn't give Bay'a, but to whom? to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wassalam, right? وَقَالَ وَتَخَلَّفَ عَلِيٌّ وَبَنُ هَاشٍ وَالزُّبَيْرِ وَطَلَحَتُ عَنِ الْبَيْعَةِ Right? And not only this, but Amir al-Mu'mineen, the whole Banu Hashim, right? Zubair and Talha, they didn't give the bay'ah to whom? To Abu Bakr. And it further continues that what was the reaction of Zubair ibn Awam at that time? that Zubair used to say at that time that I will not put the sword back to its shield until Ali was given the bay'ah. Then Umar said, take his sword and hit, hit it to the stone. Then Umar came to them and took the bay'ah from them. And then there was a difference of opinion. Then when was the bay'ah given to Abu Bakr? Um, what was the time frame that Amir al didn't give the bay'ah? And Ibn Athir says the correct report is, or the correct opinion is that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam didn't give bay'ah except after the six months after the demise of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So just to conclude this, my dear viewers and people that are listening to it, that remember this notion or this fake theory of saying that all companions were just and they were really good with each other is nothing but just, just a lie. And you could just definitely see the historical reports that we have quoted. And finally, just keep, remember one thing that there, were, there was no consensus among the companions that Abu Bakr would be a caliph or should be the Khalifa. And we mentioned what Ansar did, what was the reaction of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And the center of opposition, or should we say the opposition house at that time was the house of Sayyidah Fatma al-Zahra, alayha. And the first caliph that came in he didn't come in in a peaceful way. It was a really irrational way of coming in. And basically, the time that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam was busy looking after the blessed body of Prophet Muhammad, these people took the time advantage. They went to the Saqifah Banu Sa'ada. They got the Pledge of Allegiance. The, the tribes outside the Medina were being called inside Medina so that they could give the hand, they could give the, they could be a source of military help for Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr was able to grab bay'ah from everyone in Medina 
because of this martial law that was imposed after the death of Prophet Muhammad. Over to you, brother. Thank you, Sayyid Zaidi. Um, absolutely eye-opening accounts there from um, major Sunni sources. So um, on the question of whether these reports um, actually contradict the narrative in Iqdal Farid, what you've actually shown is that from the reports in Bukhari, uh, from the reports in uh, Fatal Bari by Ibn Hajar, from Ibn Haban's uh, book, from uh, Ibn al-Asir's book, and from Ibn Hisham, who's quoting his teacher, Ibn Hisak, the narrative is confirming what um, is written in Iqdal Farid, basically, that um, Hazrat Ali ibn Abi Talib al-Islam uh, and Zubair and Talha and uh, uh, members of the, the clan of Banu Hashim uh, refused to give bayah to Abu Bakr and that these people gathered at the house of the daughter of the Prophet Sayyidah Batul Salam Alaiha did not actually give allegiance and then we have the reports which say uh, Hazrat Ali ibn Abi Talib al-Islam gave allegiance after six months after the daughter of the Prophet had passed away. Now, th th there's a number of questions which arise here, which need to be answered, maybe not in this show, in, in subsequent shows, but I mean, one of them is why would um, uh, Hazrat Ali al-Islam not give allegiance during the uh, lifetime of uh, the Prophet's daughter? Secondly, there's also reports that uh, allegiance was given a number of times. Uh, the ridiculous concept of Adalat al-Sahaba, which uh, is not borne out by historical facts at all. Now, um, the, the question that comes to mind is, why would uh, Hazrat Ali ibn Abi Talib al-Islam refuse to pledge allegiance to Abu Bakr? Uh, Sayyid Ali Imam, I'd like you to actually shed some light on this if you can. I mean, did Mullah believe anyone other than themselves were worthy of leadership? What is certain and what we've definitely confirmed is that there was an opposition to Abu Bakr, Abu, Bas uh, Abu Bakr being uh, selected by a certain group of people. Uh, and those in opposition to Abu Bakr gathered at the house of Sayyidah Fatima. That's something which, the, you know, the, we can say with full certainty. The scholars, the Hadith have confirmed it. The scholars have confirmed it. Um, historians have confirmed it. And it's interesting because even uh, Ibn Athir, he mentions that, the, the, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, Sayyid Nazim Ghazmi, about the fact that the Pledge of Allegiance was given uh, six months after. Even though Sunnis have reports, as you said before, saying that immediate uh, pledge was given. And so these multiple pledges were given. The question that we need to ask ourselves is why? Why were these multiple pledges given in the first place? There must have been something there. Now, what's interesting is when we do go back to Sunni of these books, we, what we do find is that Imam Ali alayhi salam, in reference to the leadership, made it clear, even after uh, the death of Abu Bakr, that he was the most worthy person for, for leadership. And this is one of the reasons why B Banu Hashim um, gathered at the house of Sayyidah Fatima Salah, in opposition to that. I know there were certain names mentioned uh, earlier. It's not necessary that these individuals were loyal supporters of Bani Hashim. They may have had their own reasons as to why they did gather at the house of uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam. So the first report in Kitab al-Sunnah by uh, Abdullah ibn Ahmad ibn Hanbal, volume 2, page number 563, hadith number 1315. Abi Bakr al-Khalal, and this is a rather, an, an, uh, I'm not going to read the whole chain, I'll go straight into the main narrator. Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Bakr, the Ali alayhi salam, came to them and Amar, and may Allah be pleased with Amar, was with him. So he mentioned something, he mentioned something. So Amar, may Allah be pleased with him, said, O Amir al so he, Ali alayhi salam, said, be quiet. By Allah, I will be with Allah. Then he said, nobody from this ummah has suffered like I did when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa passed away. And we know this actually, interestingly, because we have a hadith uh, narrated on the authority from the Prophet, mentioned in Sunni books as well, that Imam Ali alayhi salam would be betrayed by the ummah. And it's, it's ironic because Imam Ali Islam is actually confessing to that very statement. And when he says, nobody suffered like I did after the Prophet may peace and blessings be upon him. That he, Ali Islam, mentioned something. So 
notice something. He's mentioning something, but we don't know at this point what he's actually mentioning. So here, Ali al Islam mentioned something. So people gave bayah to Abu Bakr. So I gave bayah and I submitted and I accepted. Then Abu Bakr died. So he mentioned something. Imam Ali al Islam here is mentioning something. We, at this point, we don't know what. So Umar became successor. Again, he, Imam Ali al Islam mentioned something. So I gave bayah. So I, I submitted and I accepted that Umar died and left the matter with these six people. So people gave bayah to Usman. So I gave bayah and I submitted and accepted. Then they are today swaying between me and Mawiya. And this hadith is being deemed trustworthy in the footnotes. Similar passage. And this is from Abdurrahman ibn Abi Bakra. And Amar was with him. Then then he mentioned something. Muhammad Ali Islam mentioned something. So Ali Ali Islam said, By Allah, I will be with Allah against whoever it is. Nobody from this Ummah has suffered like I did when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died. He then mentioned something. Then people gave bayah to Abu Bakr. So I gave bayah and I submitted and accepted. Then Abu Bakr died. Then he mentioned something. Then Umar became successor. So I, became, so I gave bayah and I submitted and I accepted. Then Umar died and left the matter with the uh, council, the six man shura. Then the bayah was given to Uthman. So I gave, uh, so I gave bayah. And I submitted and I accepted. Then they are today swaying between me and Mawiyah. So essentially what you can see is a common theme between both narrations. Something has been mentioned by Imam Ali Islam. At this point, we don't know exactly what. Okay. Both, both traditions have been deemed uh, authentic, reliable. Al-Baladri in his book, Ansab al-Ashraf, which interestingly, uh, Fareed raised an objection about about this particular historian. Uh, we will inshallah get to that. He also narrates uh, the same tradition with the Id identical chain, with the only addition with, an, with a narrator called Ruh ibn Abdul Mu'min, which we will get to inshallah. So this hadith says, Abi Bakr that Ali came to them for a visit and he said, nobody from this ummah has suffered like I did when Rasulullah died, no problem. Exactly identical to the previous narrations. Then he says, I was the one who had the right to this uh, caliphate more than anyone. So you can see the word that's actually miss missing from the previous passage. Bladri has actually included this in the Sabal and Shiraf. Okay. You can see those words have been admitted from Kitab um, al-Sunnah. They, they're not there. But in, in the Sabal and Shiraf, the words are there. Look what Imam Lila Islam says. He goes, no one has the right of caliphate more than anyone. Anyone didn't accept for them for himself. But Bayah was given to Abu Bakr and Umar succeeded him. So I gave Bayah and I submitted and accepted. Then people gave Bayah to Usman. So I gave Bayah and I submitted and accepted. And now this swaying between me and Mawiyah. So let's look at this. Muhammad Ali Islam saying, I was the one who had the right to this caliphate more than anyone. Now the additional narrator of the previous uh, tradition men mentioned in, in Saab al-Ashraf is a person called Ru uh, Abdul Mu'min al-Basri. And it's said about him that he is trustworthy and Bukhari has narrated from him in his Sahih, meaning uh, he's a narrator of Bukhari. So this is in validation of who the additional narrator is. As we've already established from the previous uh, report in Kitab al-Sunnah, uh, the tradition has been deemed Sahih. The narrators are reliable. And here with additional array of Furu ibn Abdul Mu'min al-Basri, he is deemed thicker in, uh, uh, by al-Bukhari. And this is mentioned in Al-Kashif, volume one, page number 398, person number 1594. So this previous report, as it's been uh, transmitted via Ahmed ibn Hanbal, you could see that the words have been removed. But the author of Al-Ansab al-Ashraf, al mentions what those missing words were. And those words were, I was the one who had the right to this caliphate more than anyone. Now, we know with, the, as we previously mentioned at the beginning of the show, this type of censorship when it involves the Sahaba, you will never find the totality of things without putting the pieces uh, together. So you can see that Imam Ali alayhi salam felt he was most worthy for, for leadership. Now, here's another report which supports the previous two 
uh, narrations. The report mentioned in Ansab al-Ishraf by uh, Bladri. Here's an additional report, which is a different chain. Uh, nevertheless, it doesn't contradict the previous two reports. And this is from Ibn Athir in Usra al-Ghaba, Fi Marif al-Sahaba, Volume 4, page 106. So I'm going to go straight into the narrator, and this is from Urwa ibn, uh, it's from Urwa al-Muradi, who said, I heard Ali alayhi islam saying, the Prophet died, and I saw myself the most deserving for this caliphate. But then the Muslims gathered around Abu Bakr, so I obeyed and accepted. Then when Abu Bakr was dying, I thought he would not uh, refrain it from me, but then he gave it to Umar, so I accepted and obeyed. Then when Umar was dying, I thought they would not refrain it from me, but he put the decision for a council of six men and made me one of them. But then they elected Uthman for leadership, so I accepted and obeyed. Then when Uthman was killed, they came to me and gave bayah to me willingly, not by force, but then they left my bayah. By Allah, I cannot find any solution except the sword or disbelief in what Allah has revealed to the Prophet, my peace and blessings be upon him. And you could see now the, the, the totality of things and the complete context. Uh, and it's understandable why Sunnis have um, removed these words uh, from the books, whether it be from the Imams like Ahmed ibn Hanbal, who's intentionally narrated in this way, or whether it's the individuals, the publishers behind these books, or whether the original manuscripts uh, intentionally, the compilers of these manuscripts, distort these things. But then when we look at other supporting evidences, we understand a bigger picture. And it's quite clear that Imam Ali al-Islam felt he was most worthy of leadership after the death of the Holy Prophet, may peace and blessings be upon him. And it was for this very reason that they gathered at the house of the Blessed Daughter, say the Fatima, may peace and blessings be upon her and the two children, the wife of Imam Ali al-Islam, and why certain individuals from the companions also gathered at the house of the Blessed Daughter, may peace and blessings be upon him, which led to the later events, which we which we will see in later episodes, how they unfolded and what happened and how the statement of um, uh, this historian, uh, Ibn Abdul Rab Rabbi, does not contradict other historic facts. That's all I wanted to say, uh, say Nazim Shah. Inshallah, I'll pass it back to you. Um, you can uh, perhaps give a quick recap into everything we've discussed so far, Inshallah. Um, and then, Inshallah, we will uh, see the brothers and sisters again soon. Thank you, Sayyid Ali Imam. Um, fantastic input there uh, and absolutely necessary. So uh, we see from what has been discussed that um, uh, Farid Barini's objections to Iqdal Farid are basically due to the dogmatic approach. We see that other scholars have validated uh, the author of Iqdal Farid Ibn Abdi Rabbi uh, as a reliable, trustworthy narrator, as somebody who is uh, accepted in um, Sunni scholarly circles as a uh, author and historian and um, there, there's no conflict between what he's written in his report and what um, other uh, reports have mentioned uh, between um, regarding the conflict between the Sahaba in relation to the uh, Khalafa where uh, Hazrat Ali ibn Abi Talib al -Islam, uh, Banu Hashim and uh, Zubair and other companions refused to give allegiance to Abu Bakr and this dispute carried on. And this led to the gathering in the house of Pak Sayyidah Salaamu Laleha. And the report in Iqdal Farid actually makes sense that because of this dispute and because of the opposition to the Khilafah of Abu Bakr and the gathering of the, uh, shall we say, dissenters to this unjust uh, usurpation of the Khilafah, um, <clears throat> which led to the newly formed government, which was quite insecure in its power, uh, to send its supporters, including Umar ibn al-Khattab, to the house of the uh, daughter of the Prophet, uh, Sayyidah Batul Salamullah Aleha. Um, this narration now, after what we've heard from the brothers, uh, cannot be simply 
rejected or um, weakened. But I understand why Farid Barini would do this, although his conclusions are about as safe as a bungee jump without the cord. But I leave it up to the viewers to make up your own mind, uh, having heard all of this evidence and uh, the fact that it's actually a part of the Sunni creed to try and hide and obfuscate and to uh, reject um, uh, any reports of disagreements between the Sahaba. But nonetheless, these reports are here. So if these are the reports that have survived, uh, it's up to you to make up your mind. And we can only provide you with the evidence and the means to do so. Um, inshallah, we will now return in, a, in the next show uh, to deal with the actual events at the door of the uh, daughter of the Prophet, uh, and the incidents with Zubair and the breaking of his sword, which need to be addressed as a part of the narrative. I leave our viewers tonight uh, with the, 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 the uh, discussion at this point, and inshallah, we will see you soon. So um, Allah Hafiz from all of us, and Yaili Madad to all the Mumineen.